Hello, my name is Brent Reed, and the following presentation is an overview of mechanical circulatory support in patients with advanced heart failure. Throughout this presentation, I will be referring to the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association's guidelines on the management of heart failure, which uses the scale shown here to categorize their recommendations. The relative benefit of each recommendation is categorized according to class. For class 1, recommendations are those where the benefits far outweigh the risks. Class 2 recommendations are those where benefits outweigh risks or may outweigh risks. And then class 3 are those where there is at best no benefit and at worst potential harm. Recommendations are also graded according to the level of evidence to support them, with level A representing evidence from multiple randomized controlled clinical trials, level B representing a single randomized trial or several non-randomized studies, and level C representing mostly expert opinion. In advanced heart failure, reduced cardiac output results in decreased blood flow to vital organs like the brain, lungs, liver, and kidneys. In severe cases, irreversible organ damage and even death may occur. Mechanical circulatory support is the placement of device to supplement or replace cardiac output, thereby restoring peripheral blood flow. Now, a number of different devices have been developed for this purpose, and we'll look at a few of them shortly. In general, these devices can be primarily classified as whether they provide short-term or long-term hemodynamic support. Before we discuss specific devices, let's look at the indications for temporary mechanical circulatory support. Short-term use may be considered as a bridge to recovery in patients with acute hemodynamic compromise. Examples include cardiogenic shock, high-risk interventions, or right ventricular failure. Short-term support may also be used to sustain a patient until it can be determined whether he or she is eligible for long-term support or heart transplantation. For those in whom a decision about long-term support has already been made, temporary mechanical circulatory support can be used until a durable device is placed or until a donor heart becomes available. First, we'll review several common devices that can be placed percutaneously. The first is the intraortic balloon pump. Since this is the most common device used in practice, we'll revisit it in more detail in a few moments. The impella ventricular assist device consists of a small impeller pump that is inserted intraarterially and advanced in a retrograde fashion through the aorta and across the aortic valve, where it extracts blood from the left ventricle. The tandem heart device consists of an inflow cannula that is advanced intravenously across the intraatrial septum, where blood is withdrawn from the left atrium and pumped by an external device into the systemic arterial vasculature. Extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, or ECMO, can be subcategorized based on the placement of the inflow and outflow cannulas. In veno-arterial ECMO, which is shown here, blood is withdrawn from the venous system, oxygenated, and then returned to the arterial system, bypassing the heart and lungs altogether. In veno-venous ECMO, blood is withdrawn from the veins, oxygenated, and then returned to the veins. Venovenous ECMO relies on native heart function and is therefore only used to bypass the lungs. Now let's take a more detailed look at how a balloon pump works. The mechanism of action is twofold. First, during diastole, the balloon inflates, which increases diastolic pressure. Because the coronary arteries fill with blood during diastole, this added pressure increases coronary perfusion, which is especially helpful in the setting of a recent myocardial infarction. During systole, the balloon deflates, which causes a vacuum-like effect that reduces aortic pressure. As a consequence, left ventricular afterload is reduced, causing mild improvements in cardiac output. A variety of parameters can be controlled at the balloon pump console, including whether an inflation-deflation cycle is triggered by changes in pressure, or EKG, how much augmentation is provided by the balloon, and how frequently the balloon inflates and deflates. A setting of one-to-one -one means that the balloon inflates and deflates with each cardiac cycle, which represents the maximum amount of cardiac support. 1 to 2 and 1 to 3 mean that the balloon inflates and deflates with every 2 or 3 cardiac cycles respectively, representing less cardiac support.
In this way, balloon pump support may be gradually weaned as the patient's native cardiac function recovers. A Centromag ventricular assist device represents temporary hemodynamic support that must be surgically placed. It can provide support for a single ventricle or for both ventricles. A biventricular configuration is shown here, where blood is being withdrawn from the right atrium and pumped via an external device into the pulmonary artery to be oxygenated. Blood is then withdrawn again from the left ventricle to be pumped into the systemic circulation through an aortic outflow cannula. There are a number of contraindications and complications associated with temporary mechanical circulatory support. Contraindications include neurologic devastation, peripheral vascular disease, and systemic infection. Because all devices require at least some degree of anticoagulation, bleeding diatheses represent another contraindication. Contraindications specific to individual devices include ventricular septal defects for the tandem heart and aortic disease for the balloon pump and impella device. The two most common complications of temporary support include thrombosis due to the presence of the foreign device and bleeding as a consequence of the anticoagulation required to prevent thrombosis. Others include infection, arrhythmias, malposition, and damage to the surrounding tissue. Specific complications for certain devices include perforation for the tandem heart, hemolysis for the impella device, and thrombocytopenia for the balloon pump. Some patients are deemed as having advanced heart failure that will not recover, prompting evaluation for long-term mechanical circulatory support or cardiac transplantation. Although a precise definition for advanced heart failure remains controversial, many of the features listed here are characteristic of those who require workup for advanced therapies. These include refractory heart failure symptoms, severely impaired functional status, in-organ dysfunction, repeated hospitalizations, and frequent defibrillator shocks. The mortality of patients with advanced heart failure is exceedingly high, and many consider the one-year mortality to be about 50%. Patients deemed to have advanced heart failure can be considered for one of two main strategies for durable mechanical circulatory support. Bridge to transplantation, or BTT, means that long-term support is being used to bridge the patient until a suitable donor heart becomes available. Prior to the widespread use of durable mechanical circulatory support, many patients on the waiting list died before donor hearts could be made available. Patients who are not candidates for heart transplantation but are otherwise eligible for long-term mechanical circulatory support can still receive a device in what is known as destination therapy, or DT. Destination therapy patients receive mechanical circulatory support for the rest of their life, although in rare cases they may experience ventricular recovery and the device can be removed altogether. At the time of this presentation, the two left ventricular assist devices, or LVADs, being used in the U.S. for durable mechanical circulatory support are the HeartMate 2 and the HeartWare. The HeartMate 2 is approved for both destination therapy and bridge to transplantation, and it facilitates axial blood flow, similar to the Impel device. It is a much larger device and requires the formation of a pocket for implantation. The hardware is a newer of the two devices and is currently only approved for bridge to transplant candidates. It facilitates centrifugal blood flow and because of its small size, it can be implanted directly into the pericardial space. All LVADs are preload dependent and afterload sensitive, meaning that they require adequate preload in order to facilitate blood flow and that their ability to do so can be impaired by excess increases in afterload. After device implantation, acute right ventricular failure may occur in a small subset of patients as a consequence of several factors. First, some patients may continue to have high pulmonary pressures despite unloading of the left ventricle. The force of this pulmonary pressure on the right ventricle combined with the enhanced preload due to increased venous return imparted by the LVAD may cause the right ventricle to fail. Additionally, the withdrawal of blood from the left ventricle may cause the intraventricular septum to shift to the left, changing the morphology and contractile function of the right ventricle. Although a number of parameters are important to the hemodynamic management of an LVAD, only the pump speed can be adjusted directly. Parameters other than speed include flow, power, and pulsatility index. 
Low flow may occur as a result of decreased preload, such as with hypovolemia or bleeding, which impairs device function. High flow is also problematic and results from excess arterial vasodilation. Power refers to the wattage required to drive the device. Spikes in power are early warning signs of pump thrombosis and requires urgent evaluation. Finally, the pulsatility index represents alterations in blood flow imparted by contraction of the native ventricle. Low pulsatility index may indicate a number of hemodynamic perturbations. High pulsatility index is indicative of either lead damage or in more rare cases that the left ventricle has recovered. The biggest challenge in the management of LVADs is striking a balance between thrombosis and hemorrhage. All devices require anticoagulation to prevent device thrombosis, and patients with LVADs often require both antiplatelet and anticoagulation therapies. However, the device also places patients at risk for hemorrhage, beyond simply the anticoagulation therapy required to prevent thrombosis. Von Willebrand factor, a large protein required for normal platelet adhesion, gets distorted due to the shear stress imparted by the VAD mechanics. This results in platelet dysfunction and enhanced bleed risk. Additionally, it is thought that the loss of pulsatile flow imparted by continuous flow devices impacts mucosal barriers in a way that may also increase the propensity for bleeding. Infectious complications are more rare, but are considered a serious complication of the VAD. Because the drive line that powers the device exits the body and interfaces with the outside environment, patients are at risk for infections at the drive line site as well as within the device itself. If seeding of the device occurs, the only definitive therapy is device exchange. Other complications of LVADs include arrhythmias and device malfunction. That concludes today's presentation on mechanical circulatory support. Thank you for your attention.